Welcome to the Global Missions Podcast, a show for Christ followers who want to participate more effectively in God's work, both at home and to the ends of the earth. Visit us at globalmissionspodcast.com to find show notes, resources, and previous episodes. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This podcast is brought to you by the Global Missions Toolbox, a new online collection of practical, trusted resources made for those who support global missions from home. Visit us online at globalmissionstoolbox.com to register for access to this growing collection of tools for senders. And now, here's your host, Rob Magwood, better known to many friends as Mags. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to this first episode of Season 9 of the Global Missions Podcast the very first episode of a new season. So we're excited to welcome you back, whether you've listened to before or it might be the first time that you've joined us. We are glad that you're here to learn and grow with us. I want to say a special thank you to those of you that have participated in our summer listener survey. It is always a big help to hear from you as our audience, get your feedback and some of the ideas as we head into the new season. And it's true, we've done some planning, but we're still listening taking your feedback into consideration. In fact, that survey will stay open for another two weeks. We'll be closing it mid-September. So if you haven't had a chance and you'd like to give us your input, please find the link in the show notes for this episode. Now let's get into today's conversation with Tim. Our guest today is Tim Welch, who, together with his wife Janet, served in Cote d'Ivoire in Africa, Ivory Coast, for some 31 years with SIM, including 22 years as National Director. First of all, Tim, just thank you to you and Janet for your faithful service as God's servants and as leaders in the mission field. Uh, It was a privilege. Well, praise the Lord. Currently, Tim is serving as the SIM Ministry Point Person for Literature. I'm going to ask you about that in a minute, Tim. And he is an author. He has seven books, two in English. He sank cinq livres en français, five books in French. And his new book for African children will come out later this year. Tim, together with Janet, he is a parent. They are parents and grandparents. They live in Colorado. Tim, bienvenue. Welcome to the Global Missions Podcast. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, today we're going to talk about one of your newer books entitled New Funding Models for Global Missions. And I can affirm right off the top, Tim, that this is going to be a topic of significant interest to our audience. As I speak with churches, even this morning, I was speaking with a church keenly interested in thinking through financial models. How are we doing this? How do we rethink things? How do we go wisely? And this conversation is going to be spot on. I have Tim's new book now in my Kindle, and I've read part of it. So I'm familiar with a bit of what we're going to touch on. But Tim, maybe you could just tell us about your motivation. Why this book and why now? Well, I mean, there's a short answer to that question, and there's a long answer to that question. I mean, the short answer is that I've also spoken with mission leaders, and as we were talking about how do we get people from the majority world, outside the, the Western world, to be involved in missions. And they've said, oh, the number one question is finances, you know, how to raise support. That's the number one question. So that's the short answer. The long answer is that while serving in Cote d'Ivoire, I had several friends who were also from Cote d'Ivoire being missionaries, becoming missionaries, and they had some real problems with it. One named Pierre, who serves with an international mission, he was having a hard time raising support and he talked to his mission and they said, I'm sorry, the only way you can raise support is to do it yourself. We will not allow you to do anything else. And then I had another friend named Paul And he was able to raise some support with a local mission. And then after a short while, he wasn't getting his support. That mission was taking his support money and using it for paying the electric bill and things like that. And then a a third person named Suzanne, she was trying to raise support. And she just couldn't get over that hurdle of having to ask people for money for herself. Culturally, that's just hard to do. So that's the longer answer is that, I, you know, I had personal friends, good friends of mine who were trying to do the same thing and not able to do it well. So that's was also motivation for looking into this topic. Sure. It sounds to me like it is a barrier. We'll talk about it, having some blessings and creating some barriers, but the barriers are for our culture here in North America to some degree, but it's also a barrier to 
activating or seeing God activate some of his servants from other parts of the world, in the majority world. Right. And I've been living on this same support model for 45 years now, so it works. I'm not saying we should throw it out, but I think it's working less and less, even in North American culture, getting harder and harder to do. But it's especially hard to do outside of the Western culture. It's based on certain presuppositions that don't necessarily apply to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a really important discussion for us here in North America. What I didn't do when I when I mentioned the title of the book was include the subtitle. Let me do that. The title is New Funding Models for Global Mission. The subtitle, Learning from the Majority World. And so Tim is bringing to us, enriching us by having listened to others outside of North America and bringing some of that wisdom and experience to us as well. I think it's just another example of how God is weaving the fabric of the body of Christ worldwide. And we get to learn from our sisters and brothers as well. So Tim, you do in your book provide an overview of what the Bible says about missionary funding. Would you start us off here with some of the biblical foundations? How should we be thinking about this topic? Well, yes, in my book, I do mention a number of ways that we can have financial support. Obviously, one that comes to mind is that Paul was a tent maker and he, you know, encouraged people to work with their own hands. So, you know, you see that in the book of Acts. You see where Paul planted churches and he then benefited from the fruit of his own church planting ministry. You see that in First Corinthians, you see it in Philippians and elsewhere. You see where Paul talked to some churches about financial support. Some of them were churches that he had planted. Others were, were churches where he'd never even stepped foot in, like the Church of Rome in Romans 15. And so you see that as a, as a possibility for financial support for mission. You see some of these churches not only doing one-time gifts, but you see them giving regular or recurring financial support. You see that in Philippians, you see it in 2 Corinthians 11. So those are some of the examples we see in the scriptures but also one of the terms that I, I focused on in my book, there is a Greek word called propimpo. <laughs> and I looked at the different passages in the New Testament that deal with that term. And there are five of them in Acts 15, Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 16, Titus 3, and in 3 John. And that word deals with sending somebody on their way or assisting them or accompanying them. And what I found is that when you look at each of the contexts of those passages, it's not only sending them out with finances, but it also seems to include sending them out with things like food and supplies. It talks about providing lodging or housing for them. It talks about meeting all their needs, providing for all their necessities. That's how the, the message translates that one passage in Titus 3. And it even talks about sending personnel, or at least that's implied. And the Philippian church did that. You know, the Philippian church sent Epaphroditus along with to help Paul in his ministry. So it seems that it's, it's a broader category than just sending money. And the idea, again, is like walking alongside someone, but in a figurative way. You know, you're not there with them, but figuratively you are there. You're accompanying them. You're assisting them. So it's multiple types of assistance. Hmm. Well, that seems to fit when we sometimes speak of supporters of our mission workers in these days, the goers, as opposed to just donors. If donor associates directly with a financial support, a supporter, you know, there could be lots of ways. There are lots of ways to You're a partner. Someone. You're not just a a donor, but and not even a supporter, but you're you're a partner in the in the mission. You know, it takes multiple people to send someone out. And those people who are supporting or partnering with the person who goes, I mean it's a team effort. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Well in your book you have talked about fundraise I'm not sure if the term was fundraising, but 1.0, missionary support 1.0. That model is sort of the traditional or classical way of doing it that we're familiar with in the typical missions movement now from North America. And then Tim also talks about version 2.0. I'm going to set 2.0 aside just for a moment. Let's stay with 1.0. What are some of the blessings and challenges that you've observed 
just as you've looked at that, and how would you invite us as the Western church to be thinking about the traditional model? Well, yeah, the traditional model, the classical model is what I call in the book 1.0. That is where the individual missionary has to go out and raise his or her own financial support. And that puts a significant burden on one person. Now, there are advantages to that model, and I've seen that many times in my own missionary career. One is you get to know most of your financial donors or supporters. And because you know them, you're not just a name. Those are the people who are committed to you and will stay with you for a long time. So that longevity is is helpful. And secondly, those are people who are motivated to pray for you. And, you know, you don't take that lightly. One time in Cote d'Ivoire, we were evacuated out three times. And, you know, when we had mortars going over the house, I really didn't care if I had donors sending in money, but I really cared that they were praying. So (laughs) that partnership is important. And that's, you know, a significant advantage of what I call the traditional model, where the missionary raises his or her own support because you know, you tend to know your donors better. So I'm not talking about doing away with it. What I think we can do is tweak it where we need to, and we can encourage more third-party participation. We can encourage some other things that make that model maybe a little more effective than when it's just one person having to raise all of their own support. So the disadvantages of the model are that it presupposes certain things in a culture. It presupposes a relatively strong economy. It presupposes families with disposable income. And in much of the world, that rarely happens. So that's why the majority world, you know, from my own research is, is looking at other models because it's not very helpful when you get outside of the Western world. Sure. Sure. Well, helpful to think about in those terms. And you've mentioned previously already earlier on that there's a cultural discomfort. And I think that is rising also. And our emerging generations are less and less comfortable with the idea of going out. I'm not sure that we who are more experienced in missions, let's say, (laughs) older, that it was comfortable for us either at times. It was spoken of as a step of faith to trust God to provide in this way. I think that's still consistent, right? It was a step of faith, and it is God's faithfulness to provide through donors in that version 1.0. Maybe here I will just tuck in a word of thanks to those who are listening. If you are supporting a missionary through version 1.0, and whether it's the Welch family who served decades in Africa and or the Magwoods who have been in Eurasia and in Canada, thank you so much to those of you who are giving generously and sometimes sacrificially to send workers so that the gospel can be presented cross-culturally. Thank you so much for your faithfulness before God. And before we were recording, we talked about some of these things too, Tim, and you've mentioned Philippians. When Paul wrote back to his Philippian friends, it was a missionary letter saying thank you, right, to the donors. Thank you for what you sent through Epaphroditus. It's been a blessing, and it is, in fact, a fragrant offering before God. So we're just thankful for those of you who are donating to God's work. Yes. Amen. (laughs) Well, Tim is going to stir our thinking that we want to go beyond the traditional funding model. Just before we get to that part of our conversation, we're going to take a short break. And we'd like to share with you this week's featured tool that we hope will be helpful to you and your church. The Biblical Basis for Missions Challenge is a tool meant to help you see God's heart for missions through Scripture, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. The tool is designed as a 30-day challenge that guides you through specific passages each day with key questions to reflect on along the way. Whether you take 30 days or more or less time, this tool will help anyone who wants to gain a deeper understanding of the biblical basis for missions. Find the Biblical Basis for Missions Challenge in the show notes for this episode or by visiting globalmissionstoolbox.com. We are back with Tim Welch, who is the author of New Funding Models for Global Mission. Tim, in your bio, we mentioned that your role is point person for literature with SIM. What does that mean? Okay, that means that I serve as a consultant for missionaries who are doing some type of literature ministry. 
So whether that is helping them with writing, whether that is helping them with editing, I'm trying to encourage writers around the world. But another part, which is a probably the largest part of that ministry, is I oversee a project that we called Pastors Book Set Projects, where we try to help pastors in well, any country of the world, really, and in any language, to obtain a mini library. And usually it's around 35 books, and we try to get them at a very, very affordable price, uh, usually you know, and for 60 to $70, they can get 35 books and we bring them together for a conference and then at the end distribute the books. But the goal of that is to really bring about transformation by giving pastors good resources that they couldn't normally afford. Right. So that's a big part of what I, I work on. If anyone is listening to this, Tim, and they'd like to learn more about that, how could they learn about that uh, program to extend library availability to pastors? Well, I mean, they can always contact me. I can give my email address. I mean, it's tim.welch at sim.org. So it's very simple. It's my name and my mission. So, yeah. And we'll make sure that's in the show notes as well. It's a good opportunity for me to mention to our listeners, if you're not familiar, we do take show notes for each episode. And we'll make sure that anything that Tim mentions by way of email addresses or references to other resources are in the show notes as well. So back to your book then, Tim, you have shared in your book a number of alternatives to Fundraising 1.0. Now, we can't get to them all today, but this will pique our interest, I think, and stir the pot a little bit. Tim has chosen three to share with us today. So, Tim, what's the first one, first alternative model for fundraising you'd mentioned? Okay, well, one of the alternative models is called the 12 Church Model. It's a model that I learned about in uh, that came from Bolivia, and then it's also been used in Peru. And that is where a missionary family who's raising support for going overseas, speaks to 12 churches. And one church provides support for January. And church number two provides support for February and so on. It's a very simple idea to grasp. And one advantage is that once a church gives for one month, you know, they give in January of one year, then they've got 12 months to raise that support for the next time. So they've got a a sufficient amount of time to raise the support. So it's very doable for the churches. So that's a model, again, that people have used in uh, Bolivia and Peru. And they have had some adaptations to it where like a home church might take a couple of months and other churches fewer. Or I know that one did a 14 church model where another church picked up the airline ticket for going And another church picked up the airline ticket for coming back. So there are adaptations, but it's a simple model to grasp the concept. And I think it helps missionaries, too, when they get home, assuming those churches are not spread out too far away. Geographically together. Yeah, yeah. they can visit all of their supporting churches in in several months. if We've got a few months home and that way keep up the contact. So I thought that was a wonderful model. I, and I hadn't heard of it before. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent idea that may have applications here in North America as well. Sure. Right? Oh, uh, yes. yes. Super. So this is a great example, everyone, of what you'll find in Tim's book. I have read through this chapter on fundraising 2.0, and there are a bunch of ideas like this. We'll take time for a couple more here. So there's the 12 model church. Tim, what's the next one you would choose? Well, the next one I talked about is called the Handful of Rice. That's a model that comes out of Northeast India. And what is really neat about it is that that model has existed for about 110 years now. So this is not something new, but that is where members of a church, and it was started primarily by women, these women would, when they prepare a meal, They take one handful of rice and set it aside for mission. And then at the end of a week or end of a month, whatever, they take that rice that has been set aside and give it to the church who sells it. And then that money is given toward mission. Now, you might think that's a drop in the bucket. Well, what I found out in my research is these figures are from the year 2010. But this started in northeast India in the state of Mizoram. And Mizoram, even to this day, 
is one of the poorest states in India. And in 2010, using this handful of rice program, they supported over 1,800 missionaries and they raised the equivalent of $1.5 million. And that's in one of the poorest states of India. And this program has been going on for over a century. So I think, wow, if we could have that same heart for mission, you know, that same vision, what would happen? I mean, mission funding could just explode if we had that type of vision and heart for mission like they do. Right. It really makes it accessible to people that anyone could participate in this. This is not looking to big donors. It's looking to the faithful who will give a little. Yes. And I've seen that in my own research. There were churches in Ethiopia that do the same thing. And Ethiopia is just like Northeast India. I mean, it's on the lower end of the scale in terms of economic standing in the world. And yet Ethiopia supports so many missionaries. And it's a question of the heart. Mm -hmm. A beautiful example to us. The 12 church model, the handful of rice model. That's one more that we can touch on today, Tim. Okay, it's what I call the, the mission designation, or it's like giving a mission name to something. And this I learned from people who were serving in Papua New Guinea. And there was a rancher who had some cows, and he said, okay, he's naming one of his cows India. And when that cow gets butchered, the proceeds from that butchering go to support mission in India. And then there was another, he was a farmer and he had his land that he had. He had one corner of his land that was really waterlogged, you know, it never produced much. And he didn't have a lot of faith. So he said, okay, I'm going to commit that corner of the land to mission. <laughs> and to his surprise that year, that corner produced more than any other part of his land. So not only did he provide for mission, but he also learned an important lesson in his own. Yeah, grew his faith uh, too. Yeah. Yes. And there are examples, again, from Ethiopia. When I did interviews with people there, there was one person in a church who had banana trees and he designated three of the banana trees for a mission and the rest that he would help live off of. But you can do that with anything. If you're an Uber driver, you can say, okay, my proceeds from Monday, 10 a.m. to noon, go toward mission. You know, if I'm a waitress, you know, my tips from that table on Tuesday go to mission. What You know, you can just do it with everything. And what I like about all three of these models, whether it's the 12 church or the handful of rice or the mission designation, it's the church or people in the church initiating the funding. The burden is not on the, the individual missionary, but the church or church members are initiating how to fund mission. And it really gives them a heart for mission. And, you know, that's what God has on his heart, too. So I think it really works well. Well, this is what you said is true. It's just pliable and it's applicable to various situations. A shout out to our fa a family in our church that lives on a farm and they have chickens there. And the children actually have their own chickens. And that family has taught their kids that a portion of the proceeds from the eggs that are produced there are going to be used for the Lord's work. And like you said, it's about the heart and a bit of imagination and the commitment to that, right? And it doesn't need to be big, but the Lord does use it. Yeah. I, mission funding is more about your heart than your wallet, mm, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> mm, that's really good. Well, these are just a few of the ideas that Tim has discovered in his studies and research around the world. And we appreciate you mentioning these three for us, Tim. And I'll, I'm going to encourage you to consider Tim's book. Again, it's called New Funding Models for Global Mission, Learning from the Majority World. And just adding that subtitle on there, and you can hear Tim's examples from around the world where folks with relatively modest means are participating sacrificially and deliberately in God's kingdom advance. Tim, if our listeners wanted to learn more about this topic, what other resources might you recommend to them? Well, I mean, there are lots of books that you can go to. You know, there are books in the past that have dealt with fundraising, 
obviously. There are books that deal with tent making. There are books that deal with partnerships. There are books you can read about business's mission. And I touch on all of these models. Some of these models are not new. Some have been around for a long time. But you can go online and just look up any of those topics. There are other books that are a little bit critical of the traditional model, which you can also find online. So, I mean, there are both pros and cons that you can find those books. So those are some of the resources, I think. Now, obviously, you, you go to almost any mission website or mission agency website, and they often have some things you can about how to give, how to support others. And they will also give you sometimes some biblical principles that go along with it. We will include a few of those titles in the show notes as well. And so if you are interested in learning more about this idea of giving wisely and giving wisely from the West into God's work, then you can find some resources there. Tim, if any of our guests would like to contact you, the best way perhaps is to use the email. You've already mentioned it. Okay. Yes. And I've also just set up a Facebook page for this book. So it's just the name. It's called New Funding Models for Global Mission. And I will be making posts there to share the 17 models that I talk about in the book. They're not all models. Some are more of a strategy, but 17 models or strategies for funding. So I, yeah, I plan to post regularly to that Facebook page. And then, of course, I can answer questions as they come up. Super. Well, we'll make sure that that is listed in the show notes as well. Tim, I like to close with a question. It's often posed to our guests, and I will to you as well. If you have the opportunity to stand in front of the missions committee at a faithful church, these are volunteers who want to do a good job of missions from their local church. The pastor is there. They want to share in what God is doing. What would you like to share with that group? Well, I'd share that, you know, mission is joining God in what he's doing around the world. And we have a wonderful privilege to join God in, in what he's doing. And as I've tried to show in the book, God is doing some very exciting things in some creative ways all around the world. And, you know, we get to join him in that. We get to join him in a work that is also creative. And so that's why part of the reason for the book is that, well, what are some other creative ways we can think of to support others. And so let's broaden our horizons. Let's tweak how we do things and watch and see how mission funding can really be a part of changing our world for Jesus Christ. Very good. Well, thank you again for all the effort that it takes to put a book together and to share it with us, the research and the editing, and sounds like you're coaching others to do the same. (laughs) We, the readers, appreciate it very much. Again, Tim's book was New Funding Models for Global Mission. You can find it at Amazon, and you can find it on Facebook as well. Tim, thanks so much for joining us on the Global Missions Podcast. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation. I want to remind you that our listener survey will be open for another two weeks. If you are hearing this at the beginning of September 2023, we invite you to find that link in the show notes and give us your input regarding this coming season. What began as an experiment nine years ago is continuing, and we would love for your input to shape what we're preparing for this coming year. This episode is brought to you by the Global Missions Toolbox. We hope you'll stop by the website and check out the collection of online resources, especially for senders. And we invite you to join us in two weeks when we'll continue to explore this grand adventure of being Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth.